Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, David Stewart. Thank you, officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to people who want to train as educational psychologists. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. A presiding officer, the University of Dundee and the University of Strathclyde offer in alternate years a two-year Master of Science in Educational Psychology. Educational psychology students are eligible to apply to the Student Awards Agency Scotland for a £3,400 postgraduate tuition-free loan for each year. In addition, from 2015-16, Scottish domiciled students undertaking the course will be eligible to apply for an additional loan of up to £4,500 each year to help with living costs. I met with students in the University of Strathclyde cohort on the 1st of May this year to discuss their experience of the course, the levels of support available and the work they wanted to do as educational psychologists going forward. David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Last year, a report from the National Association of Scottish Principal Educational Psychologists highlighted in stark terms that the number of trained educational psychologists in Scotland, and I quote, are dangerously low, whilst at the same time demand for services are soaring. What words of comfort could the Cabinet Secretary give to the young trainee educational psychologist I met recently, who spent a lot of time and effort to get the place on her course, but is at risk of being unable to complete it, as she tells me that the 49,000 bursary was removed by the Scottish Government in 2012? Secretary. Uh, presiding officer, there are two issues that need to be considered here, and Mr Stewart is addressing both of them, uh, and I say helpfully, uh, because I think he is. Uh, we have rehearsed these in the Chamber before, but if I can briefly explain the two issues. The first issue is educational psychologists and the uh, recruitment and retention of educational psychologists. The workforce planning that's taken for that indicates that the numbers being trained are adequate for the jobs available, uh, and as long as it does that, then clearly it would be foolish to increase the number in training. If at any stage uh, the workforce planning indicated more were required, that's something I'd take very seriously. There's also no shortage of students applying for these courses. There are very, very high-quality postgraduate courses and very high-quality students that go into it. Uh, but, of course, I'm happy to meet students and MSPs to discuss individual cases. The second point is the issue of postgraduate support. Uh, there was a very varied uh, map of postgraduate support, uh, and there are two problems with it. One is there were many inconsistencies in it which arose from previous uh, shortages and, and, and money put in to try and address those. And the second one is that there's a decline in the number of Scottish students undertaking postgraduate students. Yesterday, I announced a review to be undertaken by Brian McGregor, the vice principal of Aberdeen University, to look at the whole map of postgraduate provision and support for postgraduate provision and to see whether the prescribed list, and there is a prescribed list of courses for support, should be changed or altered in any way, and how we would do that. And I will welcome input from MSPs about that matter. Question number two, Nigel Dawn. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its assessment is of the proposal to reconsider the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route Fastlink A90 junction design. Minister Keith Brown. Uh, the design of the Stonehaven Junction, along with the suggested alternative, was debated at length during the public local inquiry in 2008. To reconsider this alternative design when the project is approaching financial close would cause significant delay to the spring 2018 completion date and incur a substantial but as yet unspecified extra cost. Nigel Dawn. Thank you. I'm grateful to the Minister for his response. We've had quite a bit of discussion about this. I'm wondering whether the Minister can confirm that changing the Stonehaven Junction, uh, as suggested, which would be a relatively small variation of contract, could not possibly be undertaken without the planning considerations which might then build in the delays which nobody wants to see. And I'm not as constituency MSP suggesting there should be any further delay at all. Minister. I understand, of course, that there were and there remain competing views on the best option for this proposal. However, they were, as I've said already, exhaustively examined by ministers and by the public local inquiry. The Scottish Government is determined to achieve the speediest possible completion of the AWPR, moving now, as I've said, towards financial close. And we would not want to risk in any circumstances the potentially uh, huge costs and disruption, the necessity of uh, a further public uh, process of consultation and possibly even a further public local inquiry, all of which should be inevitably associated with changing the route at this very late stage. Neil Finlay. Uh, can I ask the Minister what leverage he is using in this half billion pound contract to get the successful contractors, including Balfour, Beatty and Carillion, to own up, apologise and pay up to the workers that they systematically prevented from gaining employment through their practice of blacklisting? Minister, it is about the junction design of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, but you may wish to answer that. 
uh, only to say, as we've said many times before, that uh, we have made sure that the companies bidding for these contracts and others are not involved in the practices which Neil Finlay has uh, uh, mentioned. And that's our responsibility. We've taken that seriously and we've made sure we've discharged that. Three, John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it monitors the use of subordinated debt in procurement projects by the Hubcos and the Scottish Futures Trust. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, subordinated debt is invested in hub projects through Scottish Futures Trust Investments Limited, a subsidiary of the Scottish Futures Trust established for that purpose. Investment decisions are made and investments monitored by the Investment Committee of the Board. Scottish Futures Trust and Investments Limited accounts show investments made, showing investments made are published annually. John Wilson. Presiding officer, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. What discussions has he had with the Scottish Futures Trust about its prudent use of high-risk, high-yield financial instruments, namely lower-grade junk bonds, and how widely are these instruments used by hubcos for financing Scottish Government and local government procurement contracts? Cabinet Secretary. I, I can't give uh, Mr Wilson a specific answer on the, the, the point he's raised about the, 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 the quality and category of investment finance that is acquired. Um, other than to say that uh, the Scottish Futures Trust has been very successful in obtaining the necessary private capital that's been required to support a number of strategic developments and in relation to the points that have just been covered in the answer that Mr Brown has just given on the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route um, are involved in the procurement of the necessary finances to support uh, that particular project. Um, I can say to Mr Wilson that the Scottish Futures Trust has a very strong um, and robust framework for assessing the attraction of capital investment into these projects and that will be sustained by the scrutiny of the uh, of Scottish Futures Trust Investment Limited and also by the Scottish Futures Trust as a whole. Question four, Siobhan McMahon. To uh, ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to reform the private, private rental sector. Minister, Margaret Burgess. The Scottish Government has taken significant action to reform the private rented sector since launching our strategy for the sector in May last year. The 2014 Housing Act includes provisions to regulate the letting agent industry, to introduce a new private rented housing tribunal and to provide local authorities with further powers to tackle poor property condition. And we are now consulting on proposals for a new private tenancy which will improve security for tenants while, improving, while providing safeguards for landlords, lenders and investors. Siobhan McMahon. Thank the Minister for her answer. Shelter Scotland's Making Renting Right campaign has highlighted that a chronic shortage of affordable housing has driven more people into the private rented centre. Mm -hmm. Throughout my own region, there are over 20,000 private renters, many of whom are trapped renting and unable to access social housing or get on the property ladder. Does the Minister therefore support Shelter Scotland's campaign which is calling for a private rented sector that is modern, stable, flexible, predictable and fair for both the people who live in rented housing and the landlords who let out their properties. Minister. The Scottish Government has been working with Shelter and other stakeholders in developing our proposals for a new private rented tenancy and indeed Shelter's uh, campaign to make a renting right state that it states that it's supporting the Scottish Government in making renting right across Scotland. And this is because we've already put forward proposals that seek to improve security of tenure for tenants. Uh, in addition, we are working with the house building industry uh, and have funded a, a private rented sector champion who will drive forward initiatives to boost the supply of new uh, homes <coughs> purpose built for private rented uh, tenants and will unlock new sources of housing investment. Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Security of tenure and increasing rent costs are key issues within the private rented sector. So does the Minister agree with me that by introducing a standard three-year tenancy and introducing caps on rent rises would vastly improve confidence in the sector? Minister. Um, as the Member will be aware, uh, we have been uh, monitoring le rent levels in Scotland and only last week we published a comprehensive um, rent statistics and the statistics show that most average rents have increased at below the rate of inflation with some rents falling. 
However, we are aware that rents are rising faster in some areas and in some household types, and that's why we're inviting views on the issue as part of our consultation on the new private rented sector tenancy system. And that's what we're consulting on just now, and I would encourage uh, the member to uh, put her views into the consultation. Question five, Christian Allard. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the power to set the penalties for drink driving being devolved. Cabinet Secretary Kenny McCaskill. Uh, the Scottish Government has set out in more powers for the Scottish Parliament that we consider that full responsibility for the law and road traffic offences should be devolved to this Parliament. This would allow decisions to be made in Scotland about how best to improve the safety of Scotland's roads within Scotland's Road Safety Framework to 2020 document. The dev this devolution of powers would include drink driving penalties, so consideration could be given to whether changes should be made in this area. Christian Allard. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. In light of the debate on Tuesday with the Conservative amendment and the support, the welcome support of Labour members for the devolution of more powers, we write to the UK Government to highlight the cross party support in this Parliament for the devolution of more powers on the issue. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm happy to consider doing that. I think the member does raise an important point. We did debate the uh, proposal to lower the limit that's now been passed. I think there was a great deal of uh, support across the chamber, certainly from Labour benches, Dave Stewart in particular, uh, as well as elsewhere. And indeed, the Conservative amendment, I think, alluded to that, that there are further steps that could be taken, uh, whether it's in terms of graduated licence, whether it's in terms of a further lowering, but these would require uh, some other considerations and indeed powers over the pen penalties that would apply. It does appear to me that we should go further than simply having the power as a parliament to lower the limit, but to have further powers that would make Scotland safer. We have gone as far as we can with the current limits, and I am certainly prepared to consider taking on board the point the member correctly makes. Question <coughs> 6 from Dave Thompson has not been lodged. I do have an explanation. Question number 7, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Highland Council eh, regarding eh, the A890 Storm Ferry Bypass. Minister Keith Brown. Eh, on the 20th of May, I met the leader of the Highland Council to discuss a number of issues, including potential funding options for Storm Ferry. Eh, my officials at Transport Scotland continue to offer support and liaise with the Highland Council on this matter. Rosa Grant. I thank the, the, the Minister for that response. He'll know about the recent landslide, which has been one of many uh, in many, many years going back, indeed, when I went to high school in the area. Um, he, he will also know that that is the access route road for the high school and for the local hospital, as well as a well-used tourist route. And the only diversion available when there is a landslide is 130 miles long, which is not really a diversion at all. The price of rerouting um, the, the road is high, but the economic benefit, not only for the area but the rest of Scotland, would also be, an, be enormous. Um, will he consider helping Highland Council with the funding of that, maybe jointly um, Highland Council and Scottish Government funding, so that we can bring this um, to pass as quickly as possible and cease that disruption? Minister. Well, as I've just mentioned, we have had that discussion uh, at least twice now, I think, with the previous Highland Council uh, in relation to a previous rockfall and with the current Highland Council. And as I've said, we'll continue to offer support and liaise with the Highland Council in this matter. It is the case, though, that Highland Council are the roads authority for this area. Uh, and in addition to getting demands for every area of Scottish Government activity to expend more resources, also demands to spend resources on things which the Westminster Government is doing so we can mitigate them. If we also have demands to do things which are the legitimate responsibility of local government, then it's impossible to see where these resources come from unless Rhoda Grant wants to identify exactly where those resources should come from. I think the approach that we're taking so far, which is to have a discussion with Highland Council to see what, if possible, we can do intending to offer support is the right course. But as I say, the relevant local authority, in this case Highland Council, are the roads authority. It's their responsibility, albeit that we work with them. Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. The Highland Council spent many millions of pounds in maintenance and landslip clear-up on this now life-threatening section of the Strome Ferry Bypass. Would the Minister agree that the Highland Council should seek the cooperation of the McPherson family at Atterdale Estate uh, in planning the least expensive route over their land to Glen Oodlin on the bypass to the bypass? Minister. 
Uh, well, I would say, uh, as I've said to Rhoda Grant, this would be the responsibility of Highland Council. It would be for them to take forward any of those discussions and to look at the different options. Uh, both members are right to say it's a very constrained site. You have the railway right next to the road, right next to the water, and it's a very steep uh, incline right next to that. It is a difficult situation. We will do what we can, but it's right that Highland Council explore all the different options. Question eight, Chuck Brodie. Yeah, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with football authorities regarding youth football contracts. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. This is a, a matter for the Scottish Football Association and the, the football clubs. As uh, you will be aware, uh, of course, a petition has been lodged before the Public Petitions Committee on this matter. The Scottish Government has consistently made it clear that the Scottish FA and the football clubs have a duty of care for all young people involved within the Scottish Youth Football Initiative, which must be upheld at all times. Chip Brodie. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. The future of Scotland's football resides in the successful development of young male and female footballers. Some recent reports, and as the Cabinet Secretary said, evidence earlier this year at a Petitions Committee Roundtable <laughs> on Youth Football suggest that the contracted employment conditions of those young footballers might be a matter for review. Will the Government at least engage with the authorities to have them consider a further an in-depth review? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I am aware that the latest position is that the committee is expecting a, a review of the, the current registration process by the Commissioner for Children and Young People to be completed next month. I certainly hope that that helps the committee to take the issue forward, and we are very happy to engage either with the Commissioner or with the committee uh, af after that. Question 9, Michael McMahon. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it plans to replace the council tax with a local income tax. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President, officer, the Scottish Government is committed to consulting others later in this parliamentary session to develop a fairer, more progressive local tax based on the ability to pay. Michael McMahon. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response? Can I also ask the Cabinet Secretary to congratulate Christina McKelvey for her honesty at the Scottish uh, SNP conference this, the, the weekend, where she admitted that the council tax freeze was, although regressive, benefited wealthy people in her area. Is the Cabinet Secretary going to disappoint Christina McKelvey by actually changing the system and taking uh, a, a look at a, a system which is more progressive than the, the regressive council tax freeze which he currently has? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I, I wasn't aware that Mr McMahon had been present at the Scottish <laughs> National Party conference, but if... if if he was, I, I'm, if, if, this is a, if this is a gradual journey that Mr McMahon is making to come over to the Scottish National Party, he will, based on the warmth with which he's always questioned me over the years, I will give him a very warm welcome when he comes over here in due course. Uh, as Mr McMahon will know, the council tax freeze has delivered real benefits to individuals and families across our country. Uh, the council tax had risen significantly before the election of this government. We committed to freeze the council tax. It will have delivered and benefited to uh, the average Bandy householder in Scotland uh, £1,200 in benefits during the, the lifetime of this administration in the last parliament and in this parliament. That is welcome support to individuals. And for those on low incomes, the council tax freeze has had a disproportionately greater impact on the, on the household income of those on lower incomes. And that's why the council tax freeze has given such real benefits to people facing financial challenges in Scotland yeah. today. Question 10, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis has been published of the impact of welfare reform across Scotland. Minister, Margaret Burgess. The Scottish Government has published a range of analysis reflecting significant concern about how welfare reform is impacting on people across Scotland. This includes analysis on how women and disabled people are being disproportionately affected by the reforms, how the number of sanctions has been, ha has been increasing over time, how food aid provision has grown over time, in part because of the impact of sanctions, and how over the six years to 2015-16, the cumulative impact of all welfare reform changes means reductions in welfare expenditure in Scotland of around £6 billion. All this analysis is available on the Scottish Government website. Briefly, Mr Stevenson. If welfare and social policy is devolved to this place, as indeed it should be under the vow, how will the government use that to tackle poverty and create a fairer society? Briefly, Minister. 
Okay, um, our proposals will focus on equipping the Scottish Parliament with the powers to create more jobs, tackle inequality and protect public services in order to create a wealthier and fairer society. Thank you. That ends general questions. We just go right on to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer.